rest of us if we would please uh, turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 26, so 12 to the end of the chapter. So this is God's word. I'd ask that we please be attentive uh, as it is read. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill, called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath, day, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language al kadama that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of, of Psalms, May his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is good for us to come before your word. For indeed, as we already sang, we are needy souls. And the world has nothing to offer that will satisfy that need fully and finally. So let us set aside, please, the distractions of the world and the temptations of the world and help us to focus on your word and on Christ, who is the living word. And so we ask that you would indeed show us Christ and reveal your glory as your word is preached. We pray it in his name. Amen. Well, we come here to the second half of Acts chapter 1, and we want to see what their response was to the ascension, the apostles, the disciples' response to the ascension. And we want to look at what happens in these intervening 10 days between Christ ascending into heaven and his pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover, uh, so 50 days after Christ's resurrection, his death on the Passover. Three days later, he rose from the grave. The Feast of Pentecost was next in the Israelites' church calendar, as it were. And so there were many people in Jerusalem for that feast. And it was at that time that God sovereignly chose to pour out the Holy Spirit from heaven. But what happened in between the ascension and Pentecost? Well, we left off last week looking at the ascension, and so if you'll look at verses 12 and 13, we'll see that the apostles' response was an active response, active obedience and faith. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk 
from the city. It wasn't the Sabbath. This was a convenient way of Luke telling them how far away they were from Jerusalem. A Sabbath day's walk was about two-thirds of a mile. And so from the Mount of Olives on the east of Jerusalem, they returned to the city. Why did they go back? Well, you remember that Jesus had told them uh, in verse 4, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. And also then in verse 11, the angels that appeared after Jesus had ascended said to the men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken away from you, taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. In other words, don't stand around. Get about the business that Jesus has instructed you to get about. Not yet the witness to the ends of the world, but rather the waiting. The waiting comes before the witness. Why? Because they needed to be empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to be effective witnesses. And so, in act of obedience and faith, they return to Jerusalem. And the end of Luke's gospel, Luke 24, verse 52, tells us that they returned joyfully. They understood that the ascension, at least some of what the ascension symbolized and what Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ was at that point, no longer to appear to them on earth in resurrection, in his resurrection body, but rather to ascend and finally then take his place of enthronement, the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And so they joyfully return. And it's interesting and instructive too, that when we look at verse 13, we see that they return together. Now, Verse 13 says, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were saying, staying. And um, it's interesting that there's a definite article uh, for this upper room. For the last occurrence of an upper room that we read about in Jerusalem is the Last Supper. Now, we're not positive. Luke doesn't say explicitly that this was the same upper room, but wouldn't it be something if it was? And it's certainly conceivable, conceivable, very possible that it was the same upper room. Jesus had made arrangements to celebrate the Passover, and they went and prepared that place. They were familiar with it. Apparently, they knew who owned that house, and were, that room was made available to Jesus and his disciples. And uh, I don't know why we wouldn't think that it, the same room wouldn't also be available for this, too. But wouldn't it be fascinating if it was the same upper room that they went up to where they were staying? For what happened at the Last Supper? We see Jesus Christ ordaining what we know as communion or the Lord's Supper at that Last Supper. This is my body and this is my blood. We see at the Last Supper Jesus washing the feet of the disciples giving them a picture of how they were to love and serve each other and telling them that this is a new command that I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. We also are reminded if it is indeed the same upper room, it would have been very uh, in their faces as it were, that this was the room that Judas departed from to go and betray Jesus Christ to the high priests. And this is the room also that Peter made that that declaration, even if everyone else falls away, I will not. And Jesus saying, I am praying for you, for Satan desires to sift you. But when you are restored, strengthen your brethren. They gathered together in the upper room, in an upstairs room. Let's not pass over the fact that they were all together. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all had been with Jesus in the upper room for the Last Supper. They were all in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was pouring out his heart and soul to his heavenly Father. They had fallen asleep. The guards had come with torches and swords to take their Lord away, and they left him. They scattered. They deserted him. All of them left him. They all ran away. The sheep were scattered when the shepherd was struck, but Jesus Christ in his grace brings them back together. And they're all there, all except for Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. 
the apostles return to Jerusalem in obedience, and they return united in that obedience. We don't see one of them going out and saying, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be here. You guys go ahead. No doubting Thomas at this point saying, if I'm not here, he was there. They were all together. They had scattered after his arrest, but Jesus Christ had brought them together. And for you kids working on children's bulletins, if you would not only look at the Matthew references for the disciples, the list of apostles, but also Luke chapter 6. So check out Luke chapter 6 because the words, the names are the same from Luke chapter 6 and Acts chapter 1. These apostles were brought back together and they were united in their obedience. Obedience to what? Obedience to wait. To wait upon the Lord. And so what were they doing? Well, it's also interesting to note that along with the apostles were others. Verse 14, who were these others that were with the apostles? There were the women Luke says. Well, we, he doesn't specify who they were, but we know that Luke was interested in women following Christ in his Gospels. And so uh, various places in Luke. Luke chapter 8, we see a number of women that are named and uh, who, have followed, who are following Jesus and helping to support him. Luke 8, 2 and following. And then also in, in the Passion of Christ, we have a number of women named who are there at the cross. In fact, they're the last to leave the cross, and they're the first to arrive at the grave that Resurrection Sunday. So women are very important in Luke's gospel narrative, and here also in the beginning of Acts. They were there with the apostles, gathered in obedience, waiting for the promise of the Father to be poured out upon his people. It's not just the women. Oh, and by the way, uh, we know from 1 Corinthians 9, 5, that a number of the apostles were married. And as Calvin says in his commentary, why wouldn't the apostles have their wives there for such a great blessing as this, here with the promise of the Father to be poured out? And so it is very valid to think that along with the women, generally disciples of Christ, there were also the apostles' wives. But not just them, also Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, this is the last recorded instance of Mary in Scripture, in Holy Scripture. Uh, we don't know anything more about her after this. But it is instructive that she, who was also at the cross and saw her son being crucified for her sins, who believed in Jesus and God to be her Savior, as we know from her song in the Gospel accounts, that this Mary, the mother of Jesus, is gathered with the disciples in prayer. And we're reminded again of the upper room discourse where Jesus says to the disciples, if you ask anything in my name, it shall be granted to you. Jesus instructs the disciples how to pray and we dare not disbelieve that they were disobedient to Jesus' instructions as they gathered to pray. They were praying in the name of Jesus here in this upper room. And they were praying for the things that Jesus had taught them to pray. Things like the kingdom, like uh, the forgiveness of sins, like the lead us not into temptation. All of these things that we have just prayed ourselves in the Lord's Prayer were instructions that the apostles were following as they were gathered in the upper room to pray together. Joined together constantly in prayer. That word joined together means that they were of one mind. They were of one accord. As they prayed, they weren't having, I, I don't know what you think about praying for the Ravens to win. It's okay if you do. They won, by the way. Congratulations. I'm not going to be a sore loser on that one. Uh, but what if I told you I was praying for the Steelers to win? Which I wasn't, by the way. But I would have been happy if they had. Well, those are competing prayers. We can't be in the same room with the same mind if we're praying against one another. Well, the apostles, the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, along with his brothers, and I think they were his uh, brothers by Mary and Joseph, so his half-brothers, same mother, different father. All of they, these people were gathered, joined together in prayer, joined together of one mind, of one accord, they were praying. 
They were no doubt following Jesus' instructions when they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray, and he gave them what we know as the Lord's Prayer. They were no doubt understanding that they were to pray now in Jesus' name. He was their ascended Savior. And no doubt, they were praying constantly for the promise to be given. What was that promise? It was the promise of the Holy Spirit. And here is a word in season for us who have the promises of God. Sometimes when we read scripture and we see that God has given us a promise, we think, well, God is sovereign. He's going to make it happen. I just need to wait. I just need to sit back to let go, to let God, to see what's going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to watch. No. The promise of the Father was for the Holy Spirit to be given to his people. The ascended Christ said to the apostles and those with them, wait in Jerusalem for this promise. And what do we find them doing while they're waiting? They're praying. They're active in their waiting. They're active in their obedience to do what Jesus says. And they're active in their faith to pray for what Jesus has promised. Waiting... Uh, Waiting is not passive for the apostles. They gathered together constantly in prayer. And the other thing we know from the next section that they prayed for was what was going to happen to Judas's place. There were 12 apostles. Jesus called 12. And turn with me, if you would, to, uh, to Luke chapter 6. Right at the very beginning of chapter 6. Beginning in verse 12. Of those, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. And there we have the list. Before Jesus chose 12 to be apostles out of the multitude that were following him, he spent the night in prayer. Judas has deserted the apostles. He's left his place as Peter makes plain who is going to replace him, who is going to fill the number of 12 apostles. Why 12 apostles? Because there were 12 tribes in Israel. And Jesus here is restoring, as it were, Israel. And so there needed to be 12. And so what do, the, what do the people pray for? Well, they pray for the promise of the Spirit, but they also pray that God would fill their number. And that's the second half of this, isn't it? That those days Peter stood up and Peter takes the initiative and he tells them from Scripture how this is to happen concerning Judas who left them and guided those who arrested Jesus. May his place be deserted, Psalm 69. Let there be no one to dwell in it. A prophecy that looked forward to, pointed toward Judas as sort of a pinnacle of the evildoer, the one who was against the righteous one, Jesus Christ. And may another take his place of leadership, Psalm 109. Verse 8, where God intends for there to be 12 and intends for that to be fulfilled. And so how do they go about becoming 12 again? Well, the first thing is they looked at Scripture. And the second thing is they went to prayer. The Word of God directed them about what they should do. And prayer allowed them to depend upon God to do what they could not themselves. Does the word of God direct us what we should do as a church? And do we depend on him in prayer to help us do what we cannot ourselves? It was necessary for them to replace Judas. He had forfeited his place. But we also must understand that it was only necessary to replace Judas. That when James in chapter 12 is martyred for his faith, He's not replaced. 
In other words, this 12 is a foundation, a unique set of individuals chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ for a unique task. And the 12 are not replaced. Why, why can we be so sure of that? Not only because after James' death, when the other 11 were still alive, James' number wasn't replaced, but also look at the qualifications in verses 21 and 22 and tell me who in the world meets those qualifications today, and the answer is no one. Verse 20, 21, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. Why don't we have a lot of stories in the gospel about Jesus growing up? Because his ministry began with his baptism. His public ministry began when he was baptized by the last Old Testament prophet, John, and heaven opened and the spirit descended in bodily form as a dove and sat upon him, as it were, and he heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. It was at that point that the Spirit drove him into the wilderness and he spent 40 days and began his public ministry preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. So from John's baptism to the time of the ascension, the person who was going to replace Judas Iscariot needed to be an eyewitness, a disciple who had been with Jesus from the beginning. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. An eyewitness testimony was what was required of the resurrection. Jesus Christ on the third day rose again from the dead, and there was no one there to see him leave the tomb, but he was there in the garden to meet with the women and then met with the men in the upper room where they were hiding. And 40 days there were various appearances to various people at various times and places. These are the qualifications to be an apostle. There are no apostles today. But we believe in a holy, catholic, and apostolic church. If we confess the Nicene Creed, what do we mean? We mean that we believe in a church that is founded upon the testimony of those 12. The testimony of the apostles. The foundation, as Paul puts it in Ephesians, of the apostles is where our church builds. There were, there were 12 apostles who were united in prayer, united in obedience to God. They looked to God's word for direction, and they went to God in prayer in dependence. And here at the end, this is very evident because as they looked for nominations for those of those who were among them, the 120, they proposed two men, verse 23, Joseph, called, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed. Two men met the qualifications. But they weren't going to have 13 apostles. They only needed 12. How were they going to decide? They did not take a vote, as we might today, but here we see that they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen. Show us which of these two you have chosen. And so they cast lots. Now we might look at that and say how strange. And yes, in our day it is strange. Because the Holy Spirit has come in his fullness, we don't elect officers in our church by flipping a coin. No, we do go through a nomination process and an election by the congregation. But here, here when it came to this unique office called apostle, and here when there were two men who were equally qualified, and they knew that it had to be the Lord Jesus who chose his own apostles, as we've already seen from Luke chapter 6, and we're reminded in Acts chapter 1 verse 2, where it says, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. The Lord Jesus needs to choose this apostle to replace Judas, and so they cast lots. What was this process? Well, they probably wrote two names on two stones, put it in a container of some sort, perhaps a bag, perhaps a bowl, and either reached in and grabbed one of them 
or shook it until one fell out. We might say, well, then it's just luck. It's just fortunate. It's just bad luck that, that Joseph called Barsabbas, known as justice, didn't get chosen. Really? I don't think so. Proverbs 16, 33 says that the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The lot is cast into the lap, but its decision is from the Lord. And the apostles had good precedent for this as well. For in the Old Testament, we see that the two goats that came on the Day of Atonement, one of them was to be sacrificed, the other to be the scapegoat sent out into the wilderness. They were chosen by lot. The disciples looked to the word of God for direction, and they looked to God in prayer in dependence upon him. And God is always pleased to give us what he promises. The question for us is, do we know his promises, and do we believe them? Are we active in waiting for God's promises to come true for us and for our church? Why are we here this morning? What are we waiting for as a congregation? Or maybe the question is, are we waiting at all? Do we think that we've got it all together? Do we think that it's fine as it is? Do we think that we can just hang out and keep the status quo until Christ comes? Or do we take seriously Peter's admonition to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? And Jesus' instruction to make disciples of all the world and go to the ends of the earth witnessing with what, what about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not waiting, any, we should be waiting, but we're not waiting for Pentecost. Pentecost has come. The 12 apostles and all the disciples with them saw visible evidence, signs that God's Holy Spirit had come upon them. And they spoke the truth. Peter stood up and spoke the gospel. And the gospel has been continued to be preached all throughout Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When we come to the end of Acts, we see Paul imprisoned at Rome and yet free to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that gospel has come across the shores, even to America. And we too know and preach Jesus Christ. So what are we waiting for? We're waiting for his return, right? Isn't that what we're waiting for as a church, as God's people? We're longing for the return of Jesus Christ. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, is our prayer. And Jesus has promised that he will one day return. But the question isn't only what are we waiting for, but how are we waiting? Are we like the disciples in verse 11, staring up at the sky? not doing the other things that Christ has commanded us to do, not being witnesses to the ends of the world, not making disciples of all nations, teaching them, baptizing them? Are we just looking up and saying, boy, I wish this world would hurry up and end because I want Jesus Christ to come and I want to go to heaven? Are we skybound in our waiting? Or are we perhaps earthbound? in our waiting, saying, you know what? I know I'm saved. I know that I'm going to heaven. I know that I'll be okay when Christ returns. So in the meantime, I'm going to get about the work of storing up for myself treasures on earth. I'm going to get about the work of making sure my life is comfortable and convenient, as convenient and comfortable as I can make it in this sinful world. How are we waiting? Are we sitting around grumbling and gazing? Or are we gathered together to seek the Lord's will with one mind in prayer and study of Scripture? Are we, are we gathered together as God's people on mission? Are we gathered together panting after the promises of God that Jesus Christ would return and make all things right and that at, before he returns, we would be on mission. We would be reaching the lost and going out to the heartbroken and bringing mercy to those who need mercy 
and love to those who need love, that we would be gracious, light, and salt in this world? Are we assembled to carry out God's mission until he comes? That we are prayerfully and studiously looking for, to him for direction and depending on him? And if not, why are we here? If we're not here for those things, why are we here? Yes, we are gathered here to worship, but our vertical worship, and it should be vertical, compels us to go out from this place and minister to others in the name of Jesus Christ. Compels us to. We can't leave this place if we've really truly worshiped in spirit and in truth and not be transformed, not be different, not be changed, not be zealous and passionate about the things of God. Prayer is an important aspect of what we see happening in the second half of Acts chapter 1. And one pastor writes, well, our prayer never compels God. It is the unfailing prerequisite for spiritual blessing and renewal, both in scripture and experience. Our prayers don't compel God to do anything, but they are the necessary, unfailing prerequisite for spiritual blessing and renewal. Matthew Henry writes, when God intends great mercy for his people, the first thing he does is set them praying. When God intends great mercy for his people, don't we long after that? Don't we want that? Can't we be united about desiring that? And when he intends great mercy for his people, the first thing he does is set them praying. And Robert Hawker, a Puritan, Dutch Puritan, says this, no doubt the Lord inclined their hearts to be in this waiting, praying frame for the mercy they were now so earnestly expecting of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It is always a sure sign of some coming blessing whensoever the Lord sets his people a praying for it. It's always a sure sign, he says, of some coming blessing. Coming blessing means it's not here yet, means that we'll have to wait for it. But it's a sure sign of some coming blessing whensoever the Lord sets his people a praying for it. Prayer brings the promise and the God of promise together. I love that. Prayer brings the promise of God and the God of the promise together. Why? Because we're praying for the things that are promised in his word. Not just whatever we want, but the things that God wants. And when any of the praying seed of Jacob can follow up Jacob importunity of wrestling with God with an earnestness like him very sure it is he says that all the family soon find as those apostles did a promising God is a performing God God answered their prayers ten days later from when they came down off the Mount of Olives the Holy Spirit arrived their waiting wasn't passive it was prayerful, and the word of God drove them to do the things they did. Does those, do those two things characterize us today as God's people? Oh, that they would. More and more, oh, that they would. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would help us to understand that as your people, we're on mission. We've been given a task and we, we've been told that Christ is with us even to the end of the age. And, and while we long to see him, we pray that we would keep our eyes, uh, our hearts fixed upon him where he is in heaven, sovereign over all nations. And have his words ringing in our ears. You shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And know his spirit empowering us for that missionary task. Oh Lord, give us please a greater clarity from your word about what we're to be about. And give us please a greater sense of our dependence upon you that we might join together constantly in prayer. And Father, please, the promises of you which are so precious and which are yes and amen in Christ, may it be those things that we pray for. We ask it in his name. Amen.